Uh, this morning's message, I'll let you know up front, is going to be a little different than what you're normally used to. Normally when we get to this place in the message, you kind of probably get settled in and expect me to talk for a little while. But this morning, we're going to break the message into three parts. And we're going to do that because the text itself kind of does that. In fact, you'll notice in this passage in 1 Timothy 3.16, it actually is kind of even structured differently. It's, it's, uh, the text is different. And that's because um, most scholars believe this section of the scripture was a first century hymn that they sung. So when we get to this portion in the message, we're just gonna stop, okay? And we're going to engage in some singing of hymns about Christ. So we're gonna come back in the reading of the scripture about Christ. We're gonna come back and actually tuck a portion of the worship service right in the message, okay? And then the last portion in chapter 4, as we get into chapter 4 and the first several verses there this morning, is kind of a complicated section, and so we're going to dialogue through that portion. So there's three parts help happen into the message. So if, if you hear me preach and all of a sudden I'm done preaching, you say, wow, Pastor Phil wants to make sure he doesn't miss the Eagles game today. The, the, the message is only one-third of the way over, okay? So just sit tight and uh, enjoy the process as we go through that together. And I do that not just because we want to be creative, but because it seems to me that the Scripture itself actually does that. And a dialoguing environment, sometimes with the text, is actually how, um, almost like a catechist kind of, kind of way, is, is, is kind of how the Scripture sometimes communicates or relates itself. So let's get started, if we would. We've talked about the fact that this is a passage, the entire book is a book about true discipleship. I was thinking, even while Pastor Scott was praying, that sometimes, if you're new to the church, a couple of words might need some explanation. Like, what is discipleship? and even more specifically, what is the gospel, right? So let me give you just really brief definitions, and I know when they're brief, they're inadequate, but they at least give you a feel for it. The gospel is simply this, what Jesus did for you, okay? It's what Jesus did for you. Discipleship is how you become more like Jesus, right? Just think about it that way. I know it's simplistic, but, and there's more to it than that, but just for, for 30 seconds in a Sunday morning, the gospel is what Jesus did for you. He died on the cross, he was buried, he rose again the third day so that you and I might have salvation as we believe in him. Discipleship is how we become more like Jesus. And so when we talk about true discipleship, we're talking about that path to becoming more like Jesus. Now I notice a couple things immediately in the text. Here's the first thing. The disciple's faith grows best in the context of relationship, okay? The disciple's faith grows best in the context of relationship. If you uh, are new to church and you've kind of stepped in and you say, well, I think I can do discipleship if I just watch enough YouTube videos, okay? Because YouTube videos can help you fix everything. Don't you know that, Phil? Like, um, I can be a master mechanic just by watching enough YouTube videos. I would just remind you that discipleship is more than that. It necessitates relationship. And so, you and I would know that we're not meant to just learn this stuff on our own. We don't Rambo it, okay? You attempt to do that, and you're probably going to struggle and fail in some way. Discipleship grows best in the context of relationship. Let me show you that in the text. Paul says, I hope to come to you soon. Notice he doesn't say, Timothy, I'm just writing a letter. He says, Timothy, I want to see you. I want to be with you. He's communicating. But if I delay, here's what I want you to know. So he's even saying, listen, <clears throat> I don't want to be a stumbling block to you. I don't want to be a point of offense. I don't want you to think, well, Paul told me he was going to come visit me in Ephesus, but he never made it here, okay? So I just want you to see how Paul is working at that relationship. You can almost look at Paul's life in almost all those other regards and see that as well. When he writes the letter of Philemon, you may remember, he's writing that letter um, to the master of a slave who ran away and showed up in prison with him, and Paul is talking to that master saying, hey, listen, I'm returning him to you, but I would ask you to use him for the sake of the ministry, not just execute him because he ran away. There's this wonderful kind of relational focus in almost everything Paul does. Now, some of you might be saying, Way to preach that, Phil. I love relationships. I like to talk to people. I like to be engaged. Some of you are saying, oh, I hate it when he does that because I'm kind of private. I kind of like to be alone, okay? What I would encourage you to do is realize that both of those extremes can be a bit dangerous. If you are the person who likes to just talk to people all the time, you ought to ask yourself, are you always talking about you or are you asking questions about them? Sometimes Kim will say to me before we go to somebody's home, she'll say, hey, 
Um, let's not talk about all the things about us this time, right? It's a great reminder. Let's go in asking questions to discover the relationship. If you need to be pushed a little bit on the other side, then I would encourage you, um, God, even if it's hard for us, God expects us to be engaged in relationship, or we can't really say we're helping one another become more like Jesus, discipleship, right? That's the first idea. We notice it also in three words, by the way. Here they are a little later. He says, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave. Here it comes. In the household of God, which is the church of a living God, a pillar and a buttress of the truth. And we learn three things about those relationships right here, okay? Here's the first one. Paul refers to it as a household of God. It's a home word. It it actually doesn't communicate like a church building. It communicates like we should treat one another as family. In fact, here's three ideas in these three words, household, church, and um, buttress and truth, three ideas that help you understand faith-building relationships. These relationships should have the loyalty and commitment of a family. So church should be, and it's awkward to get it there, but it should be about the loyalty and commitment of a family. You say, Phil, that's a struggle for me because I grew up in a home that was really dysfunctional or I'm presently living in a home that's really dysfunctional. So when you say family, that doesn't help me. But well, fortunately for us, the Bible does engage that in a way that causes us to say, okay, that may not be the family that's our best example, but God is telling us what a family should look like that is our best example. In fact, back in John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, we read, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. Great. You and I, as believers in Jesus, are known as the children of God. We're a part of his family, but it doesn't stop there. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him, that is Jesus. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. In other words, we're in the process of becoming more like Jesus. Why? Because he refers to us as children of God, and therefore, he is our father. But it doesn't stop there. In fact, if you're over in 1 Timothy still in your Bibles, because we've been looking at uh, the end of chapter 3, just flip over with me to chapter 5, and you'll see it. Now, remember, Paul's a young man when Timothy is writing to him, and he says this, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would finish it for me, a what? A father. See how Paul brings up, the Spirit of God brings across that family idea Encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, fathers, brothers, mothers, sisters. Beautiful picture. Incredible image of how we should be treating one another. We are looking at one another as sisters in Christ or as a mother if the woman is older or as a father if the individual is older or as a fellow brother if they're our same age. I can remember when I first came to fellowship, I was much, much younger then, okay? But when I first came to fellowship, sometimes I would have to address an older man, and I can remember um, sitting in, there'd be a disagreement. I can remember sitting in the driveway in my car before I would go in to see them because there'd be a disagreement, and I would open this passage up, and I would read it and say, okay, now remember, Phil, you ought to treat him like a father, okay? Talk to him like your dad. Don't talk down, don't, even though he may be completely wrong on this issue, talk to him like you would your father. There should be an honoring and respect, okay? I can't claim that second one anymore because I'm not a younger man anymore, okay? But, but the idea is this, that there is a family loyalty and commitment in the discipleship relationship, okay? So this is a great reminder. If you're the person who maybe talks too much and you're working towards the center, if you're the person who doesn't talk enough and you're working towards the center, when you come to the center, you want to engage as you would a family. Here's the second idea. These relationships should have a common purpose and hope. They should have a common purpose and hope. In fact, we find that in um, this next word. Here it comes. Um, If we delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. There's your first word, family. Second word, which is the church of the living God. It's a great word. When you and I think of church, we tend to think of a, fac- of a facility or a building. That's why I've often liked to call, you know, Fellowship Bible Church, this is our campus, but it's not the church, okay? The church are you, the people that fill the seats. 
The Greek word ekklesia, from which we get church from, simply means a gathering of people. It's helpful to know it's not about a building, it's not about a facility, it's about the gathering of people. In fact, um, the ESV Study Bible says, Church of the Living God highlights the church as the gathering, ecclesia meant assembly, where God most clearly manifests His presence. Thus, references to God as the living God in Scripture often refer to His reality and presence in the community of believers. This is great. It's a great reminder that when we gather, we are not alone. Just say that with me. When we gather, we are... One more time. When we gather, we are... Here's the picture. We are the church, notice the text, of the living God. We gather because we're not alone, and when we gather, God is here, the living God is here. By the way, it makes such a difference. It's not like he's not here. Like you could come to church Monday morning and walk into the sanctuary and it's empty, and it's not like God wouldn't be here then. It's that we gather for the purpose and commitment to worship the true and living God. That's why we say it this way. These relationships should have a common purpose and hope. The common purpose, we come together to worship the true and living God. And a common hope, He's not a God of the past. He's not a God that is dead. He is the living God. Here's your third idea. Third idea is these relationships should be based upon the relationship a relationship with Jesus, okay? These discipleship relationships should be based upon the relationship that is a relationship with Jesus. Therefore, it's not just about, oh, I go to fellowship and I know some people from fellowship. It's about each of these growing relationships ought to be tapping our relationship with Christ. A great reminder, and we're glad you're here on a Sunday, but if you haven't come to faith in Christ yet, If you haven't placed your faith in Him, if you haven't, Scripture uses the word saved, if you haven't gotten saved yet, if if, if that hasn't been a part of the process, then you're missing out on a connection in some of these relationships. It's It's like the inside scoop on a story or a joke. You're here, but you don't really know why everybody else is here. When you come to faith in Christ, all of a sudden there is a connection, there's something else that goes on. Why? Because the discipleship relationships are based upon the relationship that each one of us has individually with Christ. And we see that because verse 16 jumps into this hymn. Great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. Here it is. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Note this, if you will. This is what we mean by the pillar and buttress of the truth. Now, watch this. Paul was writing to Timothy, who was a young pastor in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was known for their idol worship, for their Greek goddess worship, rather, at this particular temple. The temple of Diana, it was in Ephesus during Paul's time. So when Paul says, listen, you need to be focused on, you come together as a pillar and a buttress, it would be almost impossible to understand that you would read that sitting in Ephesus without a reference to this, call, to this particular architectural structure, which, by the way, had 127 pillars. Okay? It was like one of the seventh wonders of the world at the time. Uh, the, the Temple of Diana, uh, where, where a Greek goddess was worshipped, not the true and living God by any means, looked like this. Okay? Here's what I want you to see. You know what it looks like today? You ready for this? It looks like this. Because the pillars that were based upon a false goddess can't sustain even a few thousand years. But the true pillar and buttress of our faith, that is Jesus, our confidence in that truth, that's not a temple that looks like this. Think about this for a moment. You and I are still here 2,000 years later, and there's more than 127 of us here worshiping Christ. Diana's temple fell. Christ's temple does not. In fact, we're just one of many, many, many expressions of Christ living church. All around us today, in our community, around the world, Christians are meeting in various cultures, in different languages, in all sorts of different ways. They are worshiping the true and living Christ. The disciples' faith is securely placed 
in the finished work of Christ. Here's the second idea. The disciple's faith is securely placed in the finished work of Christ. So the first one is this. The disciple's faith grows best in the context of relationship, right? We talked about that. Um, it is the church. It is, it is the household of God. It is the uh, a pillar and buttress. It is those kinds of things. The disciple's faith is securely placed in the finished work of Christ. In fact, I'm going to ask our musicians to come because we're going to sing here, but I just want to introduce you to this hymn. We're going to take a break, and we're going to sing songs about Jesus, right, to confirm again in our heart who he is, what he has done. If you take this hymn and break it, um, remember how we said the disciples' faith is sincerely placed in the finished work of Christ. If you take this hymn and break it, here's what you get. Just watch this. He was manifested in the flesh, remember? Um, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, a verse we read at Christmas time, meaning Christ came. He was vindicated by the Spirit. Remember, the Spirit came upon him at the beginning of his ministry, um, descending like a dove on him at the beginning of his ministry at his baptism, and said, this is my beloved son, God said, in whom I'm well pleased. Um, and that also confirms his death, because you may remember that Jesus Christ came for this singular purpose of dying in our place. He was seen by angels. You may remember that the angels saw him at his resurrection. Watch this. We're talking about his birth, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. He was proclaimed among the nations. Even today, there are other nations that are still learning about Jesus. Only Christianity is doing that and having that level of reach. Um, he was believed on in this world. That speaks of his purpose that today, even today, you can come to faith in Christ. And finally, he was taken up in glory. That speaks of his authority. He would sit at the right hand of the Father, communicating again the authority of Jesus. It's a great reminder. We're going to pause. We're just going to sing and have some scriptures read to remember who Jesus is. Now, let me tell you, this isn't a time to check out mentally. It's a time for you to fully engage. You fully engage, even in your worship and singing, participate, sing loudly. Why? Because we are affirming these truths about Christ. Well, we're almost done, but not quite. Um, we want to take a look at this passage in 1 Thess Timothy chapter 4 because it starts to unpack what a false disciple's faith looks like. And Pastor Scott's going to come and help me here with this. And we're going to kind of do this in a question and answer setting so you can kind of begin to hear um, maybe some of the questions you might be asking. Uh, we live in a world where a number of folks have wandered from their faith, sometimes public figures and sometimes those who are closest to us, and we might wonder about what happened there or what we're supposed to do, and the Bible has answers for that, and so we're just going to kind of talk through that. And Scott, I think you're going to pop some questions at me, and we're kind of going to think through that. So we're in First Timothy um, chapter three, chapter four, actually. And if you're, if you haven't been in your Bibles yet, because we've been on the screen, we're going to drift from that uh, for just a little bit here. And you may want to, um, you may want to grab your Bibles and kind of jump around with us for this last portion of the service. Um, here's the idea that we find in First Timothy chapter four, verses one through five: the disciple's faith will be tested in order that he might know whether it is genuine or not. Now, He isn't God. God knows whether our faith is genuine. He is us, that we might begin to determine if our faith is actually genuine, saving, regenerate, saving faith or not. And I'll just read those verses in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and then, Scott, maybe you can kind of guide me with some questions there. Um, there we read, verse 1 of chapter 4, how the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. So we see in this passage some of those who begin to wander away. Scott. So, Phil, in the text here, it says, in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. Um, so, even in the news recently, we've heard of people that we believed were established in the faith, um, they were teachers, mm -hmm. worship leaders, etc., that seemingly walked away from Christ. So how does this passage kind of factor into some of that thinking? Well, I think one of the things that tends to happen, I don't know if it happens to you, Scott, but it always happens to me, is when ever I, you know, scroll down through a news feed and all of a sudden the latest author or pastor 
is saying something like what was said earlier in the summer, um, where Joshua Harris said, by every means that I have at determining what a Christian is, I am no longer one, right? Whenever I read that, it's almost like I'm shocked, I'm surprised, I'm thinking, oh no, not another one, right? And I think the thing we see in the text, you note it here, is that we shouldn't be surprised. That level of shock and letting that shake our faith, it shouldn't shake our faith. Because look how it's reading here. Now the Spirit expressly says, that is distinctly lets you know, concisely lets you know that this kind of thing will happen. It's, it's like God is saying, these things will happen. Um, that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. So I don't think we should be surprised by that necessarily. I also noticed something else in it. Um, there is a nature, Scott, in which it, in which in this text, it's demonic. Um, this is a really fascinating idea. The, the idea of demons is only found in the, in, in the New Testament some 60 times, but it's only found in the epistles, that is like the writing here in 1 Timothy, um, one-tenth of the times, like, um, like six or seven times. It's found nearly, um, I don't know, 54 times, 53 times in the rest of the Gospels. So I once heard a guy say um, something like, they asked the question, were demons more prevalent in Christ's time? Like when Jesus was walking on the face, did demons really stir it up then and they're not quite as prevalent now? And this particular pastor said, no, I don't think so. I just think Jesus could call it out for what it was. Hmm. Interesting. So he could see and say, that's demonic. I think when we tend to think, particularly since you know, we're coming up to, um, I mean, j- just to drive home, This afternoon, you're not going to see Christmas decorations. You're going to see skulls and everything else and everything that seems kind of demonic, right? We tend to think of demonic as that. And I just want to remind you, that's not the most dangerous part. The the, the visible part of a demon isn't the most dangerous part. The most dangerous part is this part, where there's deceit involved, where we don't really think of it as Hollywood demonic, but the text says that it is. Notice in this text, when a person falls away, um, it speaks of deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, that is, untruths that have been taught as truths through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. So we immediately see that there's this, um, that it's not the way that Hollywood describes it. It has far more to do with the lies that folks begin to tell themselves and begin to believe. There's a demonic element to it, I think, that we don't often talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And Ephesians 6 talks about that. Yeah, it's a spiritual and we warfare. With. And, and we, you know, when you put on all that spiritual armor, right, um, and when you come to grips with knowing the Word of God well, it's meant to be used, not just to be learned. Mm. So, you know, that's why it refers to the Scriptures as the sword of the Spirit. It's meant to be used as, a sword, as the sword of the Spirit. Um, perhaps you've heard me mention before that Don Whitney says that the Holy Spirit was sent as our helper in his book, Spiritual Disciplines. He said, the Holy Spirit was sent as our helper. We, he, we face temptation or difficulty or doubt. He runs to the arsenal and he only pulls out three verses because that's all we memorized. John 3, 16 and Genesis 1, 1 and a great commission verse. And he hands these swords to us and says, here's the best you got. There's better swords. These are good ones, but there's better ones if you would learn them. And so I think our dependence upon the Word of God and upon the Spirit of God protects us from that falling away. Okay, so this passage teaches that we shouldn't be shocked when people move away from the faith, mm-hmm. but does this text give us any clear understanding as to maybe the mechanics of that or why yeah, that happens? Yeah, I, I think it does too. I think it gives us the mechanics too in verse 3, or we might say the how, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. So, um, a searing, um, so this is my theology that I learned when I was 15 years old working at McDonald's, okay? You ready for this? Okay. Now that I have your attention. Uh, when I worked at McDonald's, we had to, on the grill, sear the burgers. Because if you didn't, you just dropped a frozen hamburger on the grill, it would bubble up and it wouldn't cook thoroughly. So they taught us, listen, press down with this metal thing, press down on the burger so that you get complete connection with the burger, it literally sticks or sears to the grill, and you could almost hear it, like you could hear the tss, right? That's the searing process. If only spiritually we had that kind of warning, right? You know, like if we started to harden our conscience a little bit, and all of a sudden we just get, and you're walking around your house, and you were saying uh, to your wife or your kids, you know, does anybody hear that hissing sound besides me? Okay, your conscience is being seared, Dad, okay? Like, you know, it would be great if we had that. We don't have that, but that's the image. The image is that our conscience would be seared. 
in the same way that a guitar player um, starts to develop calluses on their fingertips. I was talking to Asa coming down this morning about picking up the guitar and playing it more, and he said, Dad, it hurts, right? It does hurt until you kind of get some dead skin on the tips of your fingertips, and then it doesn't hurt anymore. Um, in the same way that a mechanic starts to get calluses in the palm of his hand with the wrenches. It's that same image here. And I think what happens is, um, I remember r- reading once where a writer said that um, calluses grow from rubbing up against truth without changing. So here's what happens to the person who falls away. They're hearing the truth, they're hearing the truth, they're hearing the truth, but they're not responding to the truth. And they would almost be better off having not heard the truth because what's happened now is they begin to develop a callus. And so what happens to the person who falls away is it's those smaller compromises of rubbing up against truth. I think for all of us it's a great reminder that that if the Spirit of God is saying something to you, um, you don't remain the same by not responding to it. You actually are pulling away from God by not responding to it. Mm. There's a callus developing, and the next time the Spirit of God is speaking to you, it's a little harder to hear Him because that callus is starting to develop. The, the searing image here is a really remarkable image, and notice there's two other words with it, insincerity, liars, that's the idea of hypocrisy, um, but it's also the idea that um, there's deceit again involved in the person who is falling away. This is so important, because often when you hear like a public figure or even maybe someone close to you fall away, they'll say, well, I just don't believe it anymore. I've come to grips with the fact that it isn't true. To the contrary, they believe the lie that it isn't true. You, You see the distinction in the text. Through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. So that's the image that's there. I think there's something else that's significant in the rest of that text. Uh, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Okay, watch what happens in the text here. God commends singleness in 1 Corinthians 7. He doesn't forbid marriage, but he says, listen, if you're single, you can continue in that process and continue to do ministry. He doesn't forbid marriage. See what happens is the false teacher took something that God said out of context and extended it in such a way that it became a requirement. God encouraged his fasting in Matthew chapter 6, but he didn't require abstinence from foods. In other words, what happens is once our conscience is seared, we begin to make up our own rules, add our own rules and our own laws to the process. Okay, so these false teachers that Paul talks about here in 1 Timothy 4, they walked away from the faith, their consciences were seared. So the million dollar question. Yeah. Um, were these false teachers believers to begin with? Ah, that's the question, isn't it? So, um, and know this. Um, here, my sensitivity to you as a, as a parent um, or as a child who saw your child make a confession of faith or saw your parent make a confession of faith and then there wasn't demonstrative evidence of that uh, when I say this. I, I want to be sensitive to that. But I also would tell you that there can't be a falling away if there is a genuine salvation experience, right? Philippians 1.6 says, um, but I am confident of this, that confident of this, that he that is who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it at the day of Jesus Christ. Can there be a drifting for a time? Yeah, but there can't be a permanent falling away, okay? And so, and there's other verses like Philippians 4.13 that says, um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So while there may be, I acknowledge all of us struggle with little fractures in our faith, there can't be a total abandonment unless there was never a genuine conversion in the beginning. Remember what Jesus says over in John, too, like hours before he's going to be crucified. He says, Lord, all those that, Father, all those you've given to me, I have kept. In other words, we're not keeping our salvation, Scott. God is the one who is keeping us saved, okay. just like he's the one who saved us. I wholeheartedly agree. Probably wouldn't be working here if I didn't agree with you. Um, well, but, especially if you confessed it publicly, like in front of all these witnesses. That's true. Um, but, let me, but let me push back a little bit. Okay. Um, because there's definitely some warning passages. Mm-hmm. And, man, I mean, we could talk about these for weeks on end, but Hebrews 6, one of those warning passages, specifically talks about people 
that tasted the heavenly gift, mm. uh, tasted the powers that are to come, were enlightened by the Holy Spirit. These dudes look saved. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's but, go there real quick. Okay. So if you have your Bibles, jump over with me to Hebrews 6. Um, Hebrews chapter 6. And the passage I, I think you're referencing um, is down in verse 4, right? So I'll give you a second to get there. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. Um, for it is impossible in the case of those who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and having tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up in contempt, right? So I recognize they sound that way, but I think critical to us understanding every passage that may be difficult to understand in the Bible is to remember its broader context. Um, I've said this here before, so if you've been around for a while, you know this. How many of you have said someone has quoted you verbatim, and when someone came and said, I heard you said, you have said something like, that is what I said, but it's not what I what? Meant. meant. See, you can say it just like that. It is what I said, but it's not what I meant. All they had to do was change to change the meaning was take what you said out of context, hmm. and suddenly they have a different meaning. I think when I understand this passage in light of the broader context, that once I am saved, I cannot possibly fall away, okay, because it is God who is holding me. Um, when I understand that, I come to this passage and I say, okay, then what happened here? I, I think what happens is they, the enlightenment simply means there is an intellectual knowledge, but there isn't a commitment of, of the will or the, or the full commitment of the heart to really trust Christ. They may say, oh yeah, they can even answer Bible verses for you, but they don't have a full and complete understanding in a way that it's impacted their life. And I think that's actually captured in the little word tasted. Um, and this is kind of an inside joke between a f few people who n know me, and, and, and so you know this story. But, uh, but um, due to allergies that I've had for about three years, um, I haven't really been able to taste or smell anything, right? Um, which may be problematic, I guess, if I haven't had a shower and you come into my office in the morning, right? <laughs> but it is also problematic in that whenever we go out to a nice meal, everything kind of basically tasted bland, like oatmeal. And so that's just an allergy thing. And so um, as my doctor was working with me on that, he texts me and he says, Pastor Phil, there's a new uh, Biomed out on, that just came out and it's supposed to help with um, shrinking the, sw the swelling of polyps, which is what you struggle with because of your allergies. He said, I'd like you to try this when you get back. So sure enough, we tried it when I got back. He told me it was gonna take like two weeks to take effect. Um, I'm away teaching someplace and on the third day, okay, on the third day, I go to an event, and they're grilling steaks, and I'm smelling them like for the first time in three years, right? And I'm saying, wow, that's what a steak smells like. Hey, I haven't smelled that in a while. And immediately, my stomach jumps up and says, hey, if you haven't smelled it before, now you can. Maybe you can taste it, right? And so uh, I ordered this steak, and I sit down at the table. I'm across from the picnic table at the picnic there, and uh, I'm having a conversation with these other people. And my mouth is like watering so much, I figure like I'm gonna have to cover my drool here in a second, right? Because I've not tasted this like in three years and I'm beginning to taste it. I came back and I told Kim, Kim, I am like tasting everything. Like this is amazing, like I'm tasting everything. So when I'm, Kim would say, Phil, you're gonna put on a lot of weight if you're not careful here. <laughs> and so I had this common thought with her where I would, this common statement where I would say, I'm not eating, Kim, I'm just tasting. <laughs> um, here's the thing. Um, I was tasting, but I was just tasting. I wasn't really looking at it as my sole dependence or nourishment. Um, I wasn't eating a lot of ice cream because I thought that would nourish me and make me healthy. I was just tasting it. I, I think the idea is this, Scott, that, that in the tasting of it, it wasn't a full and complete embracing. They just tasted and if they tasted and had sufficient knowledge and still they had not come to faith in Christ with sufficient knowledge and with the tasting of what was there, then what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, listen, they're not gonna come to repentance. It's not like they're off in the woods someplace and they have not yet heard the gospel. They have heard, they have tasted, and still they've rejected. And that places them, essentially, if I can use a picture, at the cross of Christ 
denying his salvation, not accepting it. I just think that's a critical understanding of Hebrews. So um, if we find ourselves in a scenario where we are becoming calloused Mm -hmm. to truth, we're hearing the word of God, it's not having an impact on us like maybe it used to, what should we do? Well, I think... um, I would probably take us to another passage there. I will take a look at that passage. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Um, notice how um, this angel or messenger uh, to the church um, says this in verse 4 that Jesus himself said, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. That's the same kind of idea, but it's not an apostasy idea, Mm. right? Or else it wouldn't be a means of coming back. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from this place unless you repent. In other words, I think if you're struggling with a callus in your own heart that's starting to rub up against the truth and you're starting to feel a fraction of your faith, I would encourage you to say, listen, I want to return to my first love. I want to come back and say, Lord, I want what I had with you before. God does not deny that prayer. He doesn't say, oh, no, no, too late for you. He begins to shave or clear off that callus so that our heart is sensitive to what's going on. Um, For the person who knows that internally, the Spirit of God is saying, listen, you are not as sensitive to the Spirit's leading as you were before, or you're you're falling to the same sin in a repeated way again and again. You're not stretching distance between that sin. You're returning to it more regularly. I'd say you just have a situation there where we want to turn back to the Lord and plead with him for repentance um, and come back to the Lord. That 180-degree turn that says, I'm turning my back on that sin and I'm coming back to Christ. And that callousness can sometimes be very subtle. I, I think that's the danger, isn't it? I think we would do well to make, this is, this is so important in the context of what we've just been talking about. We have been talking about um, why discipleship is necessary in relationship. We need brothers and sisters in Christ coming to us and saying, hey, I noticed the way you handled that. Um, not in a condemning kind of way, but I'm not sure that was the best way to handle that. Was that the most God-honoring way to respond to that person? And uh, that's, that's valuable. It's valuable. So, um, in our own lives or in people that we know and we love, if we are sensing someone starting to drift, or sensing someone starting to get more calloused to the truth, what are some things we can do? Well, I think uh, the thing I think all of us need to work with is this idea that, that Jesus, when he came into the world, was full of grace and truth. There is a graciousness in how we do it, but there's a firmness in the fact that the truth needs to be communicated and addressed. And I've always found um, this passage in 2 Timothy, not 1 Timothy, but 2 Timothy. If you have your Bibles, just go there with me real quickly. 2 Timothy chapter uh, 2. And so this is an important reminder. Uh, This is such an important reminder um, for you in regards to if you have a child who's walked away from the faith and maybe they're in their adult years and they made a confession of faith in Christ when they were in Awana 30 years ago, and and now they don't want anything to do with it. Um, I always remind people, we cannot, the danger, Scott, is that now we're trying to reach them. There should be an urgency attached to it, but there can't be nagging. Um, There should be an urgency because we have to speak truth, but to speak truth over and over and over and over again when we've already told them doesn't serve any purpose other than to harden up the callous. And I think the Second Timothy passage helps, real, helps us there because look at verse 24. Uh, actually, um, look at verse 26. I'll start there. And that they, that is the person you're trying to reach, may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So that's their status, okay? If we knew someone who was captured by Satan to do his will, we would say, I got to talk to them every time I can. Every time I can, I'm going to communicate again what's wrong with what they're doing. But look, and, 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 and I can be very manipulative in that, we might argue. Um, I can be angry, I can be forceful, I can be direct. Mm-hmm. Okay? But look at how verse 24 sets the context. And the Lord's servant, that is us, must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, 
patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Why? That God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. Mm. We can't change them no matter what we say, okay? But God can. And we actually need God to do this work because they're captured by Satan to do his will. They're ensnared. Their senses, um, they haven't come to their senses. Their senses are calloused. So there's this great reminder for us that there should be um, a clear understanding that we can certainly communicate truth to them, and we should. If they do not know where you stand on it, and you know a brother or sister or a child, and you've never spoken to them about their eternal condition and the fact that they're not living for Christ now, then you need to speak to them, okay? But once you've spoken to them and they know the truth and that's been a good discussion, to speak that way about it every time you see them, I don't think is, it becomes argumentative and quarrelsome, not what's going on in verse 24. There should be an urgency, but they can't be nagging. And so maybe the best way to say it is this way, um, we can't nag them to repentance, but we might be able to pray them there. So God never forbids us asking him for them coming to repentance. And even for us being a vehicle or a part of that, that that we might talk to them, that God might give us an opportunity or a door or a window. Um, I remember years ago I was sharing with my class on Wednesday night that I had an opportunity to interact with a man when I was in California that wasn't a believer and... um, and I'd been praying, you know, I was just fixing his wheelchair, but I'd been praying, Lord, if you might open the door of opportunity, um, then please help me know it's an open door of opportunity. And I remember I'd written him a paper because he had a question about something in the Bible, and, and he called me into his room, and, and he was there beds, in his bed, and his uh, manager said, come on back, Phil. Um, he wanted to talk to you, and he said, um, thank you for your paper. He said, I, I have a question for you. I said, yes. I said, he said, are you a Christian? Now, I've been praying on the way there. I have one stop with him that maybe God might open a door. And I said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. He said, so tell me, what is a Christian? And I was remember thinking, okay, that's definitely an open door, all right? You know, like that thing swung wide open, and if I don't walk through it, I'm without excuse, okay? So here's what I would encourage you to do. Rather than try to manipulate the process with a brother or sister who has wandered from the Lord and is in total disobedience, rather than try to manipulate that, Pray that God would open the door and then prepare that God would, that you'd be ready when God opened the door so you wouldn't be caught off guard. Um, Be thinking about what you would say if given the opportunity. So you need to speak truth, but nagging isn't the solution to returning someone who is wandering from the faith. Um, Prayer, it would seem to be, is that. And I love the way that that passage in 1 Timothy chapter 4 uh, ends it. Everything is created by God and is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. Again, the power is in the word of God in prayer, not in the words that we might say or the kind of environments we might set up. It's the, word, the Lord's work to bring them back. Great reminder. Hey, there's probably folks in our congregation, I'm sure, Scott, we all know of people who have wandered away from uh, maybe just tasted um, or who are sliding backwards, maybe it might be great if we just closed in a word of prayer for those individuals Um, because I know that our church family knows people in that condition Um, and it's always painful. It's a difficult thing. So why don't we pray that way? And for anybody, well, and I'll I'll pray for those who may have started to develop a callus, all right? So why don't you pray for those? Lord, we just uh, thank you for this clear teaching in your word. We recognize, Lord, in these last days that people will walk away from the truth. Lord, we pray that our testimony as Christians would be so clear in the midst of that. We recognize, Lord, that in the flesh we may want to become argumentative so that we can win arguments and one-up the people around us. We recognize, Lord, from 2 Timothy, that is not your plan for us. So, Lord, help us to be humble servants, ready and eager to share truth, but in a way that communicates grace also. Pray, Lord, for the people that are in our midst this morning that are in that situation and know people in that situation. Lord, we pray for opportunities for us to communicate truth. But Lord, may grace just fill our hearts and be in our lips as we do that. Pray this in Jesus' name. Father, um, 
The Christian life, you've told us, is to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling in Philippians. We don't work for our salvation, but we do work it out. And sometimes when we take that new life that you have started in us, it's challenging and we can revert back to old ways of thinking and even old behaviors. Remind us, Lord, that we don't want to develop a callus in the places where your Holy Spirit is pricking our conscience. Help us to be sensitive there. And I pray, Lord, that for those of us who are gathering here today, that where you have been working in our lives in that way, that we would be responsive, that we wouldn't put off what you have done on our behalf. Give us opportunity and help us to confess and help us to be sensitive to those sins and help us to develop the relationships, the accountability, um, the time in the word, the, 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 the time in prayer that causes us to be all the more sensitive to your work in our life. And we realize Satan's gonna wanna deceive us. He's gonna wanna tell us we're exceptions to the rule, but we're not. Help us live, Lord, in a way that we become more like Jesus every day. And it's in the authority of his name we pray, amen.